Welcome. You're watching Coyote Baptist Church online worship service. I'm Travis Drake, and I want to thank you for choosing to spend this time with us. To learn more about us, we invite you to take a look around our website, coyote.org. If you'd like to give in support of the ministry of Coyote, you can give securely online or use the mailing address. Thanks again for watching. In a few minutes, Pastor Steve will continue in the series, Life, Meet Jesus. But right now, let's sing Praising Our Savior. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. It is uh, great to host you and to have you join us uh, as Kaioki Baptist Church comes and seeks to, uh, to worship the Lord and for you to be here. We certainly hope you join us in that. Um, we go through this and we talk about um, Scripture and the Lord. And, and, and maybe I fail uh, at times just to share a little bit about the church family that is Kaioki. And 
So I wanted to take just a minute and say, here's what we're about as the body of Christ. Um, we believe that the Lord's greatness is to be declared. We believe that his love is to be demonstrated. And we believe that disciples are to be made. And that, with, with that very concise statement, we cover the vertical as we declare his greatness. We cover the horizontal fleshing out um, by demonstrating his love. And we cover the transformation of a person's heart and head, soul, and therefore his life by making disciples. So it is an exciting congregation. I love our church family. And if, if you are a part of it and yet you're away for whatever reason, come back. We miss you. And if you're not a part of it and you're not a part of a church family um, and you are anywhere in the four-state area of Florida, Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, Tennessee, Let's see, Alabama, have I said that one? I know I'm going way beyond four, but we just feel like it's worth the drive. And so we would invite you to be here. You see, I'm a little bit biased. Here's where we're at. We are talking about what happens when a life meets Jesus. And we're going through a short letter that the Apostle Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago to a specific church uh, in the city of Colossae. It was, it, from all we know, um, it was a church that had strengths. Paul brags on them at times. It also had struggles. And listen, you want to have a church that has strengths, right? But every church has struggles, and this church was no different. And the reason we're using this particular epistle to talk about what happens when life meets Jesus is because it's very practical and it's very relevant in our day and to the lives of followers of Jesus in our day. So what happens when life meets Jesus? If you have your Bibles, open them to the book of Colossians. We're going to start in chapter 3 and we're just going to cover four verses. And here's what's going on. Um, beginning in chapter 3 through the first six verses of, of chapter 4, we see we're given an explanation of how as disciples of Christ, of, of, of Christ Jesus, we are to live out what's been described in the first two chapters of this letter. Um, it's not uncommon, especially for the Apostle Paul, to lay out kind of the, the meat, the, the doctrinal truth that we need to build our lives on and then pivot and say, since that's true, this is how it affects your life. This is how we flesh that out. So whenever Scripture lays down doctrine, it almost always gives the, the, the description of how that doctrine is to be lived. And so chapter 3 and the first part of chapter 4 is really just the practical living out of what we've seen in chapters 1 and 2. The reason that matters is because the outward living of Christ inside me, of Christ inside you, um, when it detaches from belief, from doctrine, from truth, then ultimately what happens is I stand on nothing. There's, there's nothing for me to fall back on. When, when either somebody else asks me, why do you do this? Why do you practice this way? Um, or I ask myself, why am I doing this? Why am I going to church? Why am I watching an online service? What, why do I need to treat my enemy with love and respect? What's, what's that all about? When the truth, when the doctrine is removed from the foundation, then all of my outward practice of my faith 
it will ultimately collapse because there's nothing to stand on. So, in Colossae, uh, there was there was confusion about doctrine. There was confusion about truth, and what had happened is it had led to the collapse morally. These people, these people were starting to stray outwardly because they have strayed from, from truth. Now, what I want us to do is just let's go ahead and read verse 4, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going <laughs> to say this here. If this is done well and, and the, these four verses are understood properly, when we're done, there's going to be a little bit of, it seems, it seems a little incomplete. So if you're left asking when we pray to wrap up, there just seems like something needs to come next, I've probably done my job. Or better yet, I've let God's word do his job because what he states in these four verses really is the opening door to what comes next. And just as I'm excited about these four verses, I'm excited about what comes next and what we'll be looking at next week. So let's, um, let's go ahead and read Colossians 3. Starting in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Um, so, how are, how are we going to live out truth? How does one, when you, when you come to understand that Christ is the way, is the truth, and is the life, John chapter 14, what, how does that impact me? What does that look like? There is a myth that goes something like this. If I follow God and I give, surrender my life to the Lord and I live out um, his life in me and I follow what he says in his word, then my life's going to be cheated. It's going to be short-circuited. Um, I will be kept from really living and I'll never experience the freedom that is, comes with being a part of the human race. I'll be like a square. When the truth is that it is in Christ alone that real freedom is found. Um, true freedom, true liberty comes in the exercise of fully diving in and swimming in the ocean of life that God has created and established for his child to enjoy. And anything short of that, really, instead of being free, when I live in opposition to, to God and to his truth and to his way, then what I'm doing is I'm putting shackles around my wrist and around my ankles. Because I'm living maybe as the world sees what the world calls freedom, but the, what the world calls freedom, the Bible says in Proverbs, ultimately is going to lead me to death. They're just leading me along a path, broad as it is. A lot of people occupy that path, and they at times seem happy, but at other times seem absolutely miserable. That's what I want. Or the one that breathed the breath of life into me says, and live it my way. I know what brings you will bring you ultimate satisfaction and happiness and joy. Trust me. Follow me. So, we learn that it is in submission to Christ and to his authority that 
we find not only freedom, but we find satisfaction. So here's what, here's what I want us to see. We're going to look at today what to know and do. What to know and do. Remember, the Apostle Paul has been confronting false teaching in the church at Colossae that is trying to convince these Christians that they need to submit not to God's word, but to the teachers, the false teachers' understanding and promulgation of what they say is God's word. They have been pushing, you need to attend feast and you need to follow certain dietary restrictions. And basically you need to submit yourself to the law and the things of the law. And Paul has been saying, why would you do that? All of those things pointed to Christ. Christ has come. He has set you free. Seek Jesus, follow Jesus, live for Jesus. And don't settle for lesser things. So with that stated, so what do we, what do we need to know and what do we do? So let's look at them. There are going to be three things that we're going to talk about. And here's the first thing. If you're taking notes, you can just jot down. We need to know that for the Christian, your security is in Christ. Your security is in Christ. I want you to notice a couple of phrases in these, uh, in these verses that we read. The first one is, is just the first part of verse 1. Paul, Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ. Now just step back and ponder and let the reality of that truth start to seep into your soul. If then I have been raised with Christ. Now remember in verse 20 of chapter 2, he's just written, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, right? Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? If you've died in Christ, know this, you have been made alive in Christ. When you come to faith in Jesus, not only are your sins forgiven and... Um, not only were you adopted into the family of God and made his very own child, but you were also raised with Christ. We have, we have gone from bondage to freedom. The shackles have been released. Uh, Paul writes earlier in chapter 1, we have been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his light. It's a powerful realization that we have been raised with Christ. The second statement is found in verse 3 where Paul writes, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, um, what does that mean? What does that mean to have your life hidden with Christ in God? Well, um, what it is, is it means that we are um, to be absorbed up in Christ. When you, when you wed, we've been raised with Christ with this reality that our life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, let me put it this way. Have you, ever, have you ever spoken or observed someone who is extremely self-centered? Everything is about them. It's very, very hard for them to have an ongoing conversation about anyone else because 
they're caught up in themselves. And we use that terminology. They are caught up or they are wrapped up in themselves. Or somebody that is absorbed with their job, they are wrapped up in their work or their careers. Or somebody that is wrapped up in their kids. When you, when you think of someone that is wrapped up in themselves or a part of their lives, uh, that's what you identify with them. You identify them with them. Well, when, when people think of you, what do they think? What comes to mind that you're wrapped up in? What are you absorbed in? Paul is telling us here that we are to be wrapped up in Christ. We have been raised with Christ and we have been hidden with Christ in God. Um, this is what gives us security, is Christ. It's, it's why we understand and how we understand the truth of Scripture that teaches us that when we are in Christ, we remain in Christ. Salvation is not a fleeting thing. I'm not saved today, but if I slip up, I'm lost tomorrow. I'm, I'm a Christian today, but if something bad goes wrong, I'm no longer a Christian. I have to get re-saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that we are wrapped up in Christ. We have been raised with him. We are hidden with him in God. So our security is in Christ. Second, your sight is to be on the things of Christ. Your sight is to be on the things of Christ. So since at salvation you are raised with Jesus and you have been hidden with Jesus in, in God, the question becomes, what's my response to be to that? What do you do with that? How does this affect you, your actions, your thoughts? Well, the answer is found in verse 2. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. This is, this is something that... Is possible, but it's only possible when a person is in Christ. I set my sight on things that are above. So when someone says, um, you know what, I, I, can't, I can't get my eyes and my mind off of, of, of this life struggles. I can't get my eyes and my mind and my thoughts off of the temptations that this life brings me. Ultimately, what it, it is screaming is, an, I don't have a changed heart. I've not been raised with Christ. I'm not hidden with Christ. Now, this gets to be somewhat personal because at times most of a struggle with, with this life, this world eyes, right? When, when we are struggling financially or we are struggling at work or we've got uh, issues with our children being rebellious or whatever it might be, when, when a person struggles with pornography, and that's a very visual, obvious picture of my eyes being stuck on the things of this life. Scripture's God's answer to us is, listen, you don't go down, you go up. If you've ever, if you've ever been around sports, there's a football expression that coaches use, and, and it's the phrase is this, you gotta coach them up. When a team is struggling, a coach's responsibility is to coach his team up. You don't coach a team down. You don't, you don't want to just continuously mash them and, and, and have them ultimately think, I can never do this. I can never block. I can never tackle. I can never run through that hole. You coach them up. You can do this. 
You can make this happen. And what sometimes I think we do as followers of Jesus is our, we, we set our eyes solely to what the things of this world are, and they're appealing. That can be very appealing at times. They're very tempting at times. And we think <laughs> that we will be satisfied, even though that satisfaction is fleeting, in, in the horizontal things, instead of setting our eyes on the things that are above and looking upward, which are the things which are the things of God. The person without Christ, here's the bottom line, the pers person without Christ has no desire to seek the things that are above. And dear friend, I would say to you, if you have no desire to seek the things that are above, you, knew, you need to do some soul searching, and I mean literally soul searching. And you need to ask yourself, if, there, if, if I'm not feeling any conviction about, about the way my viewing of, of, of this life and the temptations of this life, if I'm not having any sense of, you know what, no big deal, or, or it is a big deal, then you, you probably need to ask yourself, do I, do I really know Christ? Does Christ live in me? Have I been raised with the Savior? Am I hidden with Jesus in God? All right? Because he is my security, but don't misunderstand. If I'm not in Christ, I'm not secure. And the way that's played out in my life is my eye, I set my eyes on the things that are above, on the things that are of God, on the things of Jesus. It doesn't mean they, that they're 24-7, they're, they're 100 percent of the time there. I'm tempted. I, I fail. But the ultimate push is I need to look up and not look to others and not look out. I, I, I run away. I push back from the fleeting pleasures of this of this life and of this world, and I set my gaze upon he who is most beautiful, he who is most satisfying, and I trust that. I trust that. Um, okay. For the follower of Christ, your greatest joy is found in Christ himself, in him and the things that he loves. And that's a, that, that can be a hard pill to swallow at times. F.F. F. Bruce, F.F. F. Bruce, understanding what Paul is saying here in verse 2, ver, actually these first two verses, writes this, believers have no private life of their own. Their life is the life of of Christ. Hmm. Let that rattle around a little bit. If I'm a follower of Jesus, I have no private life of my own. My life belongs to Christ. So for most of us, we settle for lesser joys, even joys that reflect God. There are lesser joys. When, when I look at my children or my grandchildren, that's a joy. That's a real joy. But if that's where my joy ultimately stops, if that's, if that's where I find joy and I, that's the end. I, I, I only want to be with my kids or my grandchildren. Or I'm looking at a beautiful, cool, crisp autumn day and I'm finding satisfaction and joy in that, but that's where it stops. If there's no connection to the one that gives those children, if there's no connection to the one that created that cool, crisp autumn day, then um, these things are good, underst un understood, but these things are not an end to themselves. They all point to something better. 
I mean, is there anything better than a Reese's peanut butter cup and a cold glass of milk? Very little. But if merely swallowing and tasting the joy that it comes with a Reese's peanut butter cup and a glass of milk, if that's where my joy ends, fleeting is a good word for it, is it not? There is an end, there is an author, and there is an end to all things. And what the Word of God tells us is the author is God and the end is God. That's why we're told here in verse 2 to set our mind on things that are above. And one aspect of this truth is that it, we are to see things as God sees things. And something that's very fresh and relevant to me is um, when a believer dies. We have had a series of deaths at, in, in our church family. And um, even my own mother just a few days ago uh, was called home to be with the Lord. And my mom was, uh, like most moms, I hope you can say this of your mom, was such a pivotal figure in my, in my life and the life of my brothers and our children and grandchildren, and um, she was beloved. And she, the reason she was so beloved is that she had an intense love for Christ. She loved God. Um, I brought her Bible just to show you. This was hers. This was one of hers. She had many, but this is the one she used for probably the last 30 years or so. And uh, she taught um, out of this Bible for, all, for most of those 30 plus years. She carried it with her. She read it daily. Uh, she loved the Word of God and she found it uh, in this, this particular Bible. But as her days began to come to an end um, and then just recently the Lord she passed, the Lord called her to himself. You know, there's a big void in, in her, her children's lives, but her, though her presence will be missed, the truth is she's with the Lord. And to understand where my mom is and to see it as God sees it, um, it, it, it affects you. It affects the way you grieve and it affects the way you mourn. Life from her perspective is not only very real, it is better than it has ever been. And so when, when I set my mind and see things as God sees them, then I rejoice for my mom. Now where this resonates for all of us is in just the daily aspects of life that we are confronted with and we face or we enter into. If I'm offered a new job or I'm thinking of marrying someone or I've been given maybe a severe medical diagnosis or a, a woman is pregnant and considering an abortion, you know, and on and on it goes. Well, the, the issue is will I set my mind on things above and see things as God sees them? Or am I going to keep viewing things from just the horizontal perspective as everybody else sees them? Because as, as everybody else sees them, it's going to, the, 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 the ultimate question is, well, what's best for you? What's best for me? What's the, what's the, what, what's the immediate decision that helps me the most right now? And I don't bother to lift my eyes and see things from above as God sees them. I'm just constantly trying to say, what's best right here and now? And that is a horrible and a defeating and a very deceptive way to view life and the issues that everybody encounters. Uh, I can recall... When, uh, I, when Susan and I were living in Fort Worth, I was going to seminary, and um, our first year out there, we uh, joined uh, a church. It was a very large church, had a dynamic, very, very uh, 
God-loving, scripture-preaching pastor, and uh, it was just a good place to be. And um, a man in our congregation uh, accepted a position. He was very active in the church, and he was... Um, he, he held leadership roles in our church, and it was a tough decision for he and his family, but he accepted a position in a corporation that meant more money for he and his family, meant more authority in his career, a higher rank, but also meant moving his family out of state. And so they left. Nine months later, he and his family return. They come back. I mean, not just a visit, they're back, right? Right? You know, and you're wondering, what, what happened? What's going on? Maybe the job didn't work out. And what I found out was he was doing great at his new job. Everything was going fantastic. But here's why he and his family moved back. He and his wife decided that because of our church, he did not believe that God would have him sacrifice his family in this new environment where they could not find a healthy church family. And so he made this crucial decision of saying, what's more important, the spiritual well-being of our children and my wife and I to be invested in a truth teaching, Christ-exalting atmosphere and church body or more money and more power. And so they moved back. It made, it made the decision simple. Go figure. Somebody would move or move back on the basis of a faithful church family. Well, that's, that's what happened. That's what they did. And what he was doing was he was setting his mind on things that are above. The world would listen to his story and go, man, you are nuts. Because they see things as everybody else sees things. This man and his wife saw things as God sees things. Hey... It is easy to set yourself apart by trying to look the part, by, by looking different or in your verbiage speaking different or coming up with a long list of do's and don'ts and having everybody think, well, aren't they religious? But to see things as God sees them and to act on those things, yeah, it's not so easy. It's not so easy. Sometimes it defines you and it defines your life. John Chrysostom, known as uh, the golden tongue one, considered one of the great preachers of the early church. He was Archbishop of Constantinople um, around for, in the years around 400 AD. He was um, brought before... Empress Eudoxia of the Byzantine Empire, and she wanted him to renounce his strong allegiance to Christ and bow before her. So first she tries to scare him with banishment, and his response is, you cannot banish me, for this world is my father's house. But I will kill you, said the empress. No, you cannot, for my life is hid with Christ in God, said John. I will take away your treasures. No, you cannot, for my treasure is in heaven and my heart is there. Eudoxia responded, but I will drive you away from your friends and you will have no one left. And John said, no, you cannot, for I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate me. I defy you, for there is nothing you can do to harm me. Now, that is seeing things. That is setting your mind on things above. And do you notice everything John responded with was absolutely true? 
But everything he responded with was viewing life as God views life. If he viewed, if he viewed life as if everybody, as the world views life and, and the world was his advisor, then he would have been putty at her feet. I mean, she would, have, she would have stepped all over him. But what do you do with truth? And I think for a lot of us, we could, we could learn, not just from John Chrysostom, but we could learn from the truth of Scripture that God is always, always, always proved true if we would just set our minds on the things above. See life as God sees life. Really see life as God sees life. So, all right. Here's number three. Here's the third thing I, I want you to, to notice, and that is that your future, for the believer, your future culminates in Christ. Your future culminates in Christ. Now, here's the reality. Right now, if you just look out horizontally, if you judge and gauge everything based on how the world judges and gauges and views life, then nobody sees and nobody knows, and a lot of those people don't care, that you're seated at the right hand of God. They don't know that you've been raised with Christ. And, the, and, and, and reality is, in this life that we all live, we function by the same laws of nature, the laws of God, as everybody else. You cut us, we bleed. We love our families, we love our country. Um, in order to fly, we need American Airlines or Delta to take us somewhere, right? But here's what we need to know, and it's where, in this passage, it's where Paul takes us. That is, what is seen today is not the whole story. You want the whole story? Well, cast your eyes at verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, although you don't see it and nobody else sees it today, Today, you have been raised with Christ. You, you have been hidden with Christ. But the day is coming when the skies will part and the trumpet will blast and time as we know it will cease and all eyes will be on the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this reality that causes his children, his disciples, to do great things. It's why the disciples, all but one of them, were martyred in the name of Jesus, for the cause of Jesus. It's why missionaries even today go out and put their lives on the line. It is because there is a day coming. This life is not the end of the story. But here's what you need to know, and this is where it, it, it affects you and me. Great acts, great choices, great moments begin with small decisions, small choices to see who we are in Christ and to see this life and all that's involved in this life as God sees it. Francis Schaeffer, who was one of the really great spiritual giants for Christ of the second half of the 20th century, uh, as he neared the end of his life, he was a voluminous letter writer. And I just want to read an excerpt to you from a letter he wrote, a, a personal, a dear a friend of his, close to his death. And uh, I, want you, I want you to notice the choices that he's making to make a mark. Now, he's already made a great mark, but, but listen to his words. I quote, God willing, I will push and politic no more. 
The mountains are too high, history is too long, and eternity is longer. God is too great, man is too small. There are many of God's dear children, and all around there are men going to hell. And if one man and a small group of men do not approve of where I am and what I do, does it prove that I've missed success? No, only one thing will determine that, whether this day I'm where the Lord of Lords and King of Kings wants me to be, to win as many as I can, to help strengthen the hands of those who fight unbelief in this historical setting in which they are placed. To know the reality of the Lord is my song and to be committed to the Holy Spirit, that is what I wish I could know to be the reality of each day as it closes. That's a man who has a grasp on seeing things as God sees things and understanding that his life will culminate in Christ. That there is a day that we stand before him and all things are brought and made clear and we will give him glory. It is true for Francis Schaeffer, it is true for me, and it is true for you. What a great Savior we have. What a great salvation he has afforded us. I, I want to close just by reading uh, one stanza from one of my favorite hymns. It's the hymn Before the Throne of God Above. And um, it, it does a great job of summarizing what we've talked about today, what Paul describes in this opening of, of Colossians 3. One with my Lord, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is safe with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Amen. I hope you know that Savior. I hope you know the security that comes in that Savior. I hope that if you're not already, that you will begin to cite things and view things as God himself views things and not get lost in the mundaneness of this world and this life so that you can see that there is a day coming when all things will culminate and we will all give glory to the Lord Jesus. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for how you love us. And God, I just would pray and ask now that uh, for every Christian that, is, that has watched and listened to this service, this message, that if, if we are bogged down in the trivialities of trying to survive another day in this life, that God, through your mercy and grace, we will set our eyes above upon you. And you, in that, will enable us to see life as you see life. Not in the short term, but in the long run. And Father, for anyone that has uh, watched and given of their time that does not know Jesus Christ, maybe there's an interest Maybe there's a, a, a curiosity. God, may they in Jesus find not just a religious figure, but the creator and the savior of their soul. And Lord, would they surrender that, their, their personal life to you, to your authority, to your love, and to the wonder of the cross of Christ where their sins are forgiven and their eternity is secured in the empty tomb. We love you. And God, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you. God bless you. Join us as we close our service in praise to Jesus.
You're the voice of love that's calling There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands Savior